Okay. So let's see where we left off. Uh, I think we were talking about the uh, sphenoid bone with the cella tersica. Um, don't forget the pituitary gland sits in that little cella tersica. It means Turkish saddle. So the calvarium is cut off of here. The skull cap is gone. So you're looking down inside and the brain has been removed. So let's just look at some big structures that we can see in here. There's a foramen magnum. Magnum just means large. Foramen's a whole. This is part of that ethmoid bone that we kept talking about. Remember the pneumatized, the shape? Pneumatized. Um, so it has a little plate going across right here that's called a cribriform plate, and it's got all these little holes in it. And your olfactory bulb, you know, for cranial nerve one, uh, is sitting on either side here, and it's got little protrusions that go down into there, and you have, you know, olfactory receptors down in your nasal cavity. Um, so that's what goes through those holes. Can't really see it here, but this thing poking up is the Christogali, and it... I think it means crest of the rooster, crest of the chicken, something like that in Latin. It looks like a little sailboat when you see it from this side. Um, so connective tissue hooks to that. You'll learn about that later. Some of your dura mater hooks to that that holds the brain in place. Now then, this is a big fossa. That's a big fossa. And that's a big fossa. So fossa are dips. So if I put a piece of tape here or a pointer and I go, what is that dip? You go anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa, posterior cranial fossa. Okay. Um, this ridge right here, it's kind of hard to see, but it's poking up. It's very, very hard bone. And uh, that's the petrous part of the temporal bone. Okay. Um, so if you cut down through that, you would run into uh, basically your semicircular canals, you know, part of stuff from your inner ear, cochlea. We'll get to all that on lecture on test four. Okay. Uh, we'll learn some of these holes later. Okay. But right now, don't forget the big guy, foramen magnum. All right. So here we flipped him over and we're looking from underneath here. And so there you can see the frame and magnum again. And these two big knuckles on either side of it are occipital condyles. So your first vertebra, uh, these sit on your first vertebra. Your first vertebra being the atlas. That's C1, cervical 1. All right. Oh, by the way, look, you can see the palatine bones and the little protrusions right there. If you go into the screen, that would go up to the orbit there. And up to the orbit there. Remember, Palatine's part of your orbit. Uh, some more important holes. You have this carotid canal. You know, your, your uh, carotid artery, internal carotid goes through there. You have this jugular foramen for the jugular vein. Um, and if you notice, the carotid canal is all within the temporal bone. The jugular foramen is kind of a area where the occipital bone and the temporal bone didn't quite fuse so it leaves kind of like this oblong it's not a real good circle like the carotid canal is uh, so it's a lot bigger and it's a little more posterior so that's the jugular foramen that's the carotid canal so don't get those two confused got them on both sides right okay now this is your frontal bone remember when you're infant or fetus it's two bones and then they completely fuse um, usually you don't even see a little line there they call that the metopic suture that's uh, one of the names it had once upon a time first they called it the frontal suture but the students were getting it all confused because well it's not going in a frontal plane the coronal suture is going in a in a frontal plane so they call this uh me topic to avoid any confusion but lately in your book in the eighth and ninth editions i think they've gone back to calling it the frontal suture um in most people it's not even there you probably can't even find it um because it just fuses so completely it just becomes one bone okay um but i have seen it on skulls uh this is a basically a mid sagittal cut and I want you to pay attention to the uh, spaces here. So that's a frontal sinus. 
It's a stenoid sinus, stenoidal sinus. You can't see the maxillary sinuses because uh, you're cut down the middle. The maxillary sinuses are lateral. You know, they're kind of over these molars on either side. Uh, but this hollow area, these hollow areas in your in your bone here, it makes this whole skull lighter. Plus the maxillary sinuses, that has to do with resonance for speech and stuff like that too. All right. Parietal bone, I would never just show you a parietal bone by itself. It'll always be connected to a skull, right? So if I put the pointer there, you go parietal bone. Is that a flat bone of the skull? Yes. How did that ossify? Which type of ossification? You would go intramembranous ossification. Now, I'm probably not going to hit you with these temporal lines, sorry, uh, because they go over more than one bone. Uh, when we get to muscle and muscle attachments or origins, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, foramen magnum we talked about, occipital condyles we talked about, right? Uh, superior and inferior nuchal lines, they're not too good on this one. You're upside down, so here's the inferior and there's the superior. And then you have an occipital protuberance on the very back, and you can probably feel that bump on the very back of your head. Not everyone has it, but it's called an occipital protuberance. Okay. All right, so there's a temporal bone by itself. Okay. So this is part of your zygomatic arch. So that's your zygomatic arch right there. It's made of two parts, and we'll get to that. Um, but this is called the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. This is called the external acoustic meatus. This is a styloid process versus a mastoid process. So you can see a process doesn't always look like another process, doesn't always look like another process. you got to kind of use your imagination. But they're protrusions, basically. Here we cut into the uh, mastoid process, and it's kind of spongy. That's almost what like a, a pneumatized bone would look like inside. Um, but uh, these are just kind of like little little air pockets in here. And so the problem is, say a little kid gets an ear infection here, the bacteria can get through and set up in here under certain circumstances. That's a very dangerous situation because the brain is not far away. Right, so uh, they got to watch those little kids. It can happen to an adult too, but on a little kid, they got to watch them very closely, make sure that they're not getting what they call mastoiditis. Right, um, here you flipped it over, and you're looking from underneath. That's where the mandible. Well, sorry, that's where the mandible sits, mandibular fossa. Right, uh, here you're looking at it from inside, like you took the skull cap off, and you're looking from the inside. And that's that petrous part or petrous portion I was telling you about. Uh, so I would put hard ridge or something like that if I was pointing at it uh, for a test. And uh, that should give you a hint. Petrous means rock, right? So uh, like petrified wood, you know, that, you know, it's hard as a rock. Um, you drill through the rock to get to the oil. That's, I think that's why petroleum is named like it is um, from that root word. There's a Batman bone. Don't call it the Batman bone. That's a sphenoid, but it's not connected to anything here. But you can see the cella tersica. This is anterior. That's posterior. So that's where the pituitary gland sits. There's a greater wing and a lesser wing. Right? Uh, got these little holes. These may be, these may come into play. I think they're in your lab book. So foramen rotundum, foramen ovale, foramen spinosum. I tend to do those on the sphenoid bone when it's separate. It's just easier for you guys. Um, and then also you can't really see it, but you get these optic canals. You can see those when you're looking in the orbit because that's where your uh, optic nerve from your eye comes through. One comes well, say this is from the right eye, that's from the left eye, they come through here. And basically those optic nerves, they'll cross over here. That's cranial nerve too, by the way, optic. Um, and some of your vision from this eye goes on to the left side of your brain. Some of it stays on this side and goes to the right side of your brain. So it's just kind of a weird little system. 
uh, so you, so your optic nerves make a cross over your uh, pituitary gland. So if you get a tumor in your pituitary gland, it can swell up and push on the nerves above it and cause visual disturbances. That could be uh, one of the only symptoms they have if they have a pituitary tumor. Uh, the good news is they're usually benign. Uh, the bad news is they're in kind of a tough spot. So they have different ways of treating it now that help treating something like that. All right, there's Batman bone. <laughs> Don't pay attention to these holes that they drilled into it. See, they took a drill and they drilled a big hole into the body here. They're just trying to show you that it's hollow. That's where your sphenoid sinus is. But this is nice because you can see the uh, lesser wing and you can see the greater wing. And then you can see the superior orbital fissure. Remember us pointing that out inside the orbit? Yeah. The fissure is like a long linear opening. Okay. And then these feet that are hanging down are called pterygoid processes. And you're not going to need to know medial plate and lateral plate, whatever. Um, I could just point at the whole thing and draw a circle around it. They did like they did here. And you go pterygoid process. Pterygoid, I looked it up in Latin. It means wing. So I guess because this whole bone has wings. Uh, but to me, these look more like feet. <laughs> right. Anyway, they're called pterygoid. The P is silent. Don't go pterygoid. Pterygoid process. Probably that uh, dinosaur bone, the pterodactyl, remember? It's probably from that same root word if you watch Jurassic Park. I think they had one on there. Um, here's your ethmoid. Remember, this guy is a pneumatized bone. That P is silent there, too. So, in real life, this guy is really fragile. So there's the cribriform plate I was telling you about. There's the Christigali I was telling you about that looks like a little crest of a rooster. To me, it looks more like this is it from the side. It looks more like a sailboat sail to me. Right? Uh, there's your perpendicular plate hanging down. Don't confuse the perpendicular plate with the cribriform plate. Cribriform plate's going horizontally. Perpendicular plate's going up and down. And this doesn't have holes in it. This is just a plate. Right? So, don't pay too much attention to these guys. Uh, I guess I've done them as a bonus, but that's a concha. You know, like a conch shell in the, that you find on the beach. You know, put it to your ear and you can hear the ocean. I think it's from the, you know, same root word. So, these are little swirly looking bones on either side. So, when you breathe in, they kind of, the air goes through these little, grooves here and it swirls the air around warms it humidifies it there's also an inferior nasal concha so it's three on each side one two and then it would be one down here that's coming off the maxilla uh but you can't see that here okay so there's our i love these questions zygomatic arch what two things make up the zygomatic arch the zygomatic process of the temporal bone Temporal process of the zygomatic bone, just those little protrusions, right? Oh, there's your nasolacrimal groove. You can kind of see it. Your tears flow through there. There's your maxilla, right? I probably should give you infraorbital foramen, but I wouldn't do it unless it's like a super bonus. <laughs> but now this mental foramen, that's fair game for sure. That's that's fair game. Uh, on the other side of this mandible will be something called a mandibular foramen. Also, that's fair game. All right, let's look at hard palate. What two things in this year above it and you're looking down? So there's your palatine bones, right? There's your maxillary uh, palatal processes of your maxilla, okay? So you got one on each side. So all of this, so a palatal process of your maxilla and the palatine bone, that makes up that side of that hard palate, okay? Um... Can you get a cleft if these don't fuse completely? Yeah, you can get what they call a cleft palate in development. In other words, when they're coming across this way and this way when you're developing, they may not meet in the middle and fuse. And so you, you might can end up with a cleft palate. You know, sometimes that happens on, you know, little kids. They can repair them later, and they, they're getting better and better techniques at doing that. Um... Vomer, remember the perpendicular plate, the ethmoid, and the vomer make up the nasal septum. Okay. The vomer's a very wide bone, but when you're looking at it from the front, 
it looks like an you know an inverted V, which helps remind me of Vomer. And there's your perpendicular plate. There's one of your concha, right? Your middle nasal concha, and there's your uh, inferior nasal concha that's coming off of your maxilla. I don't know why they didn't color it in the same color. Um, all right. There's your mandible. I'm never going to ask you the body of a mandible, but I could ask you coronoid process. means crown. That looks like a piece of a crown. This you can call, your book calls it the head of the mandible, right? And then the protrusion holding it, they're calling the condylar process. Back in the old days, and still almost everyone I know, instead of calling this the head of the mandible, they call it the mandibular condyle. Almost everybody I know. You know, all the docs, uh, all the dentists, all the oral surgeons, they still call it mandibular condyle. But if you say head of the mandible, hey, mandible, that's fine too. Ramus, just this flat area. Remember, ramus means branch. I'm never going to ask body of the mandible. You know, um, I could ask body of the sternum, right? Because that's part of that sternum. Um, this is the mental frame. And, and then when you look over here on this side, so here they're showing it to you on another, on the other side. Uh, they flip this guy over. And that's your mandibular frame. And so a nerve goes into there. And we'll learn about those nerves later, but it, but it innervates these teeth. So that's the one that the dentist will numb up that nerve. You know, he'll put anesthetic back here. He or she'll put anesthetic back here. And hopefully numb these teeth up before they work on them. Okay. So that's a very, very important hole. Especially if you're going into dental, right? So put a circle around that mandibular foramen and, and just understand that it's on the inside of these guys, right? It's on the tongue side, where the mental foramen is on the cheek side, on the outside. Okay. There's a hyoid bone. Don't overthink this guy. If you just see something that looks like a horseshoe, um, I'm just showing you the hyoid bone, right? And so it's, you know, functions and, yeah, we'll. We'll get into that when we get to muscle, I guess. Um, but it's floating. It's it's not um, it's not touching any other bones. So see the way it's just held in place by muscles and tendons, basically. Okay. So I can go true or false. The hyoid bone is a fixed bone of the skull. False. Right? It's floating. So much so that even on a, on a skeleton, they just have to wire it on because there's nothing for it to hook to. Right? On a, you know, in the, in the lab, it'll just be little wires holding it in place. Uh, let's look at sutures. Here's a sagittal suture, right? In that mid-sagittal plane. Uh, there's your coronal suture, right? Don't call it frontal. It is in a frontal plane. But remember, the frontal suture would be like this, which I call the metopic to avoid any confusion. Then in the back, lambdoid. Make sure you spell it right. L-A-M-B-D-O-I-D. I think that's from the Greek letter lambda that is kind of shaped like that. Um, I never looked it up, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what it's from. Then on the side, you can't really see it, but there's a squamous suture. You can kind of see it here. Squamous. Okay. So make sure this I have named. See that little suture going right across there? It's in between your frontal, it's in between your nasal bones and your frontal bone. So frontonasal suture. And I have done a bonus here. I think they're calling that the internasal. Look it up, make sure I'm not lying to you. And this one's fair game intermaxillary suture. It's in bold, but it should have a box around it. Okay. Um, so that one's fair game. Too. All right. So on a, a skull, on a fetal skull, let's look for the soft spots. The soft spots are called fontanelles. Fontanelle. So this is a fontanelle. That's the biggest soft spot. You know, like when a little baby's born, it'll be soft right there. You have to be really careful. Um, I just name them by position, anterior fontanelle, posterior fontanelle. Then when you come on the sides, I call this one anterior lateral fontanelle, posterior lateral fontanelle. If you want to get fancy, you can go sphenoid, 
fontanel because see there's part of your sphenoid bone you can go mastoid fontanel because your mastoid process is going to be right there but you stand a chance of getting those backwards if you're not real familiar with your landmarks and your bones so i just go anterior lateral posterior lateral it's on each side right those two are and then up top you have a anterior fontanel posterior fontanel these are sutures or sutures to be sagittal suture coronal suture metopic suture squamous or squamosal suture uh lambdoid sutures right so i could i could also name the sutures there or ask you to name them uh there's your normal curves of your backbone right so you have cervical vertebra thoracic vertebra lumbar vertebra then you got your sacrum, which are fused vertebrae, and your little tailbone, the coccyx, which are fused vertebrae also. So you generally have seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, and five lumbar vertebrae. So we have seven of these cervicals. Don't forget the top one's called the atlas, and then the one right under it's called the axis, right? Atlas and axis. If you get confused, just go C1, C2. I can't count you wrong. How many cervical vertebrae does a giraffe have? If you watch Animal Planet, seven. They're just great big uh, cervical vertebrae. So especially they only have seven cervical vertebrae. <laughs> um, look that up. Make sure that's true. That's just what Animal Planet said. Um, these are ligaments that go around your um, vertebra. So this is kind of cool. So this anterior longitudinal ligament uh, on the front of these bodies, see it right here? And this is the posterior longitudinal ligament on the backs of these bodies. And then you got your spinal cord in these arches, right? In the roof of these arches, it kind of skips. It's a kind of a weird one. You put a box around, it's called the ligamentum flavum. So put a box around ligamentum flavum. Sounds like something you get at Baskin Robbins. Um, put a box around posterior longitudinal ligament. That's an important one. And then this guy is important. Interspinous. These are spinous processes. Inter means in between. Interspinous ligament. And this big guy, kind of round, is the supraspinous. Supra means above. Right? Okay. So let's go over them again. Anterior longitudinal ligament. Posterior longitudinal ligament, ligamentum flavum, interspinous ligament, supraspinous ligament. Now, these are important. You know, they, they probably got some good elastic fibers in them, but they're pretty sturdy because you don't want these things to shift too much. That's why the these intervertebral uh, joints are amphiarthrosis. They don't move a lot and because you don't want them to because you're trying to protect the spinal cord here, right? Um, this is a lumbar vertebral. Just let's look at the big parts. The vertebral body. That's the big part. They also call that the centrum. C-E-N-T-R-U-M. Mainly that's the orthopedic surgeons that call it that. Um, I just say vertebral body. It's easier. Uh, this is your vertebral foramen. That's where your spinal cord goes. Okay. That's your spinous process. This is your transverse process, transverse processes here. They're poking out to the side. And then this is coming up at you. It's kind of hard to see, but it's called a superior, uh, well, oh, this is the inferior view. Never mind. So this is below. Um, so this is an inferior articular process with a facet and on the other side. So there's your superior articular process. And it has a flat spot on the other side called a facet. And here's your inferior articular process. And on this area right here, it's flat where it's rubbing on another one. And that's uh, a facet. You know the way a diamond has facets. Facets are flat spots. So uh, that's why you got to be careful and see. They're, they're talking inferior view here. It almost confused me. You know, it's very hard to tell sometimes when you're looking at it at a drawing it's much easier if we were in the lab so this is one of those things you got to pay attention to make sure you know what's the top and what's the bottom okay so there's your transverse process coming at you there's a superior articular process going up inferior articular process with a facet on it going down 
there's a spinous process. So <laughs> a student came to me years and years ago, uh, about 15 years ago, and said, Greg, look at this. Uh, this looks like a moose. <laughs> it kind of does. It looks like the nose, and you got the little ears or antlers or whatever poking out here. It, it does kind of look like a moose, <laughs> right? And then she showed me um, a thoracic one. And she goes, and this one looks like a giraffe. See the nose? <laughs> and I said, I'll be darned, it does. Um, so the thoracic ones are, uh, they look like a giraffe. And then my students, even though they knew that, they would still keep mixing it up. They knew it looked like one was a giraffe and one was a moose, but they couldn't remember lumbar versus thoracic. So I made up a saying. It's kind of stupid, but it works. You know the way you tend to get a slipped disc sometimes, and it's usually down low in your vertebral um, column. Um, then I go, the moose is loose in the lumbar region, <laughs> right? It, you know, it just helped them remember it. The moose is loose in the lumbar region, like if you had a slipped disc way down low. And then I, on the giraffe, the giraffe lives in thoracic park. You know, it's kind of a play on Jurassic Park. And then they never mixed them up. So anyway, the giraffe is thoracic. The moose is lumbar. Okay. So remember those things we just talked about? All those processes and the body and the vertebral foramen and all that good stuff? You got the exact same stuff on the thoracic vertebra. You still got a spinous process. You still got a body. You still got superior articular processes with facets, inferior articular processes with facets. You got transverse processes, but you have a facet there too. And you also have some new facets here that we don't have on the vertebra because ribs are rubbing these facets. So that whole head of one rib is sitting kind of in between two vertebrae here. So it's rubbing a half of a facet here. And on the one above it is rubbing a half of a facet there. If it's in that, you know, place. Um, so your book says superior costal facet for the head of the rib. That's too much. I call this a demi facet, which means a half facet. That's the old name. Superior demi facet, inferior demi facet. And then the rib goes around this way and then it goes that way. So the back of that rib is rubbing a transverse costal. It's kind of hard to see, but the rib will be sitting here. And then it would come around like this, and then it would go to the sternum out here, if that makes any sense. Uh, I think I have it on another picture to show you. But the back of that rib is rubbing a transverse costal facet here, and the back of this rib on the other side is rubbing a transverse costal facet there. So I can go, true or false? Lumbar vertebra have transverse costal facets and demi facets. And you go, false. There's no ribs down there, right? Uh, let's see, no demi facet here. No transverse costal facets. Now, let's look at cervical vertebra. So, this is just a, I don't know what number this is, probably like four or something like that. Uh, but notice the way you still have transverse processes, but they have holes in them. Okay? The holes are called foramen, transverse foramen. Okay, so if you see little holes out here, not the vertebral foramen, right, not that, but out here, then you know you're looking at a cervical vertebra. And things go through there. You'll learn about the vessels later. Now, something I forgot to talk about just a minute ago. If you look here, this is an arc, right? It's made up of four things. This is called a pedicle which means foot or base, and that's called a pedicle. That's called a lamina, and that's called a lamina. So pedicle, lamina, lamina, pedicle. That makes up your arch, right? So in the lab, I generally would just wrap a pipe cleaner around this and go, what is that? And you go, lamina. I'd wrap it around here, and I go, what is that? And you go, pedicle. I go, what is that hole? And you go, vertebral foramen. Now, when you're reading your book, don't confuse the vertebral foramen with something they call the intervertebral foramen. So you can't really see it here, but say this is sitting on another vertebra right here. It's kind of a fake hole. See this notch? So now it kind of gets closed off because it's got another one of these guys below it. And 
your sp a spinal nerve comes out of here. It's not a real foramen, but they call them intervertebral foramen because when the column is all together, they look like holes. See, see them there, and then nerves, you know, come out of there. So don't confuse the vertebral foramen with the intervertebral foramen. Okay, same thing here. Okay, um, what's left on the atlas? You can see how that's that's the one that your skull is sitting on. I'm not going to even make you know top from bottom, front from back on this guy. Well, front and back is pretty easy to figure out. Um, but um, this is anterior here. Um, so this is the way it sits. And you can see that's anterior. This is posterior. Um, but do you still have uh, transverse foramina? Yeah. Foramina is plural. Foramen is singular. Do you still have a vertebral foramen? Yeah. Then you look at the axis, you see it's got the little thing poking up. That's like an almost like an axle. That's uh, called the dens, D E N S. So that's uh, basically what this, you know, remember this is a pivot joint. So it pivots around this dens. So, uh, yeah, you do have a little ligament here. I don't know if, I don't know if that's in your lab book or not. Uh, that transverse ligament. Um, you know, holds it in place. They also call that the in your book the odontoid process. O d o n t o i d. Um, and both those dens and odontoid mean tooth. You know, like dentition. Um, so it's it's like a tooth-like process. I say dens because it's a lot easier. Okay. Uh, atlas and axis, I generally just call them C1 and C2. That way you never get mixed up. Okay. And then uh, vertebra promenades. What is that? Some people, C7, the process, you know, the spinous process will poke way out. And you can see it, especially a lot of times on females. You can see it because it's not quite as much muscle sometimes over this region. Uh, and so it will be very prominent. And that's called the vertebra promenades. It's not on everybody, right? And that ligament, uh, we'll get to ligaments later, another lecture, that goes from here all the way up to the external occipital protuberance. They call the ligamentum nuque. Nuque, N-U-C-H-A-E, means neck. Don't worry, we'll get to that later. It's the supraspinous ligament. It's just got its own name right there. All righty, almost done. Sacrum. These are fused, remember? Vertebra that are fused. You got sacral foramina. You got a median sacral crest going down the back. There's a tunnel going under here. That's called the sacral canal. Things go through there. We'll talk about that when we get to neuro. There's the opening right here is called the sacral hiatus. I wonder if that's where that saying comes from. I'm going to go sit down and take a hiatus. You know, go take a break. Uh, then basically you're sitting on your hiatus. <laughs> right. I don't know if that's where it comes from, but it helps me remember it. There's your little coccyx. See, it's a little fused vertebra. Okay. Um, C-O-C-C-Y-X. Don't confuse that with coxal, C-O-X-A-L, which are, we'll get to those on another lecture. Um, auricular surface, it looks like an ear. See how that looks like an ear? Don't call it articular surface, although it is, and you'll get a half a point. Call it auricular surface, right? And then, then we're good, okay? Median sacral crest, sacral canal, that's hollow all the way under there. Sacral hiatus opening, coccyx, um, auricular surface, then we're good. Yeah, do you have superior articular processes with facets? Yeah, you do, because these are vertebrae that are fused, remember? So those are poking up to articulate with that uh, lumbar five. Then here's your sternum. Top part's called the manubrium. The middle part's called the body, so I can't ask body here. If I put the tape right there and go, what part of the sternum is that? You go body. What part of the sternum is that? This is xiphoid process. What part of the sternum is this? Manubrium. Does the manubrium have a notch right there? Yeah, they call it the jugular notch. Does it also have a notch right there for the clavicle? Yeah, they call it the clavicular notch. Okay. Um, this is just showing you, remember on a thoracic, on a giraffe, 
uh, you're rubbing a demi facet here, superior demi facet. Then you're rubbing a uh, transverse costal facet here. And then the ribs going all the way around. See the way this rib goes around. And it would be hooking to the sternum up front. This is a different side. Um, this is a right one. That's a left one. Um, so I love the way they name things on a rib. Head, neck, tubercle, groove. <laughs> I mean, that's about as simple as it gets. And this end is the sternal end. So this is a vertebral end, the head is. And this is the sternal end. And these are usually pretty smooth right here because they're, they're hooked to that cartilage. Okay, see the way it's hooked to cartilage. So the, you got 12 ribs on one side and on the other. So the first, uh, the ribs 1 through 7 are called true ribs. And 8 through 12 are called false ribs. Of those false ribs, 11 and 12 are floating, so they're not hooked to cartilage at all. They're just floating. Why do they call them true and false? Well, that's because on the true ones, the cartilage is hooking from the rib straight to the sternum, rib to the sternum, rib to the sternum, rib straight to the sternum. That's why they're called true. False is kind of weird. It's because the cartilage is hooked to more cartilage that's then hooked to the sternum. So in other words, you got the rib hooked to cartilage, that cartilage is hooked to more cartilage, which is hooked to the sternum. Where up here, the cartilage just hooks straight from the rib to the sternum. That's why they're called true and false. Okay. Um, we did those ligaments already. That's a herniated disc in the lumbar, where I said, you you know, you can slip a disc, they call it, um, sometimes. Um, and it's pushing on that nerve. See, these are intervertebral foramen here. And so that can cause pain or problems, right? So what a normal disc, you have this pulpy stuff in the middle. It's called nucleus pulposus in the middle. It's almost like a jelly-filled donut kind of thing. And then the connective tissue going around and around and around. See the collagen fibers going around. Annulus fibrosis they're fibers and annulus probably know that word like the earth goes around the sun annually from the same root word there's your uh, palatine bone we talked about there's your median palatine suture we talked about uh, on the front would be the inner maxillary suture this is the median palatine suture okay and then we're done all right, we went a little bit longer than 30 minutes, but we're good. Okay, so I'll shut this down and I'll uh, record it and put it up on YouTube for you. Okay.